nervous because then I'll have to call everybody if I don't. So, uh, okay. In keeping with the tradition of starting on time, I'd like to welcome everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, honored guests. I'm giving the speech. One second. For those of you who don't recognize me, my name is Nina Muller. I am chairperson of Chiba. That stands for Chug Yedidot Beit HaKneset HaGadol, the women friends of the Jerusalem Great Synagogue. I thank Asher Shapiro for handing me his scepter, for opening the evening and conducting the evening. I have the honor of welcoming Ms. Violeta Popovete, Counselor of the Embassy of Lithuania in Tel Aviv. And to her I say, I'm going to do my best. I learned it in another language, I just found out. La bisvakeras es vike ad viken which means good evening and welcome in Lithuanian. Don't quote me. And to Stephen Linda. Lind, can I see if you're here? Stephen, welcome. Editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post. A dear friend and supporter of the Jerusalem Great Synagogue. I welcome you and thanks for being here. Before I introduce our panel, our guest this evening, Allow me a few minutes of introduction. They say it's always helpful to catch the audience's attention with a joke or two. So, computer challenged as I am, I googled Lithuanian humor on the computer and the search revealed no results. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. When I was thanking Asher for handing me the scepter of conducting the evening, we're trying to bring Chiba, the uh, what we call sisterhood or ladies league of the synagogue back on the map. We have a lot of great plans and a lot of great programs, some of which have been implemented. Others need your support and commitment to get going. We need women to give us a hand. So, whether you daven here or you don't, you are most welcome to join and make the dream come true. So, you can either give a call at the office and give your name and your phone number or come up to me after the lecture this evening. This is our legacy. Looking up the definition, it said, Legacy is something handed down or received from an ancestor or predecessor. The parashot this week of Vayakhel and Pekude speak of the Mishkan, the temple. And there are detailed and intricate explanations of how it should be built. The person in charge is a man by the name of Bitzalel from the tribe, from the Shevet of Yehuda. Hashem, the Lord, fills him with wisdom, intelligence, and knowledge. The verse reads, With wisdom, knowledge, and intellect. And then the verses continue, Ulehorot natan bilibo that Hashem grants him, in his heart, the ability to teach, to transmit. And the Ibn Ezra gives an interesting explanation about it. He says, Yesh chachamim rabim shehim kashim lehorot laacherim. There are a lot of intellectual people who don't have the gift to be able to give it over to others. The gift given to Betzalel and his assistant, Ahaliyav, was to be able to give, to share that knowledge, that intellect with others. This thought allows me the best introduction to the two authors of the book we'll be discussing this evening, The Legacy. They are both Klau mention. That's something you'll read about in the book. 
It means not only to identify with the history of our people, but also its future and its destiny. Rabbi Beryl Wine is the founder and director of the Destiny Foundation. For over 25 years, he's been identified as one of the most foremost Orthodox historians in the world. And without going into the details of his being the recipient of the Torah Prize Award and being a columnist in the Jerusalem Post, I can tell you after going to quite a number of shiurim and lectures that he has gotten this ability to transmit and to give over, and that's very special. Rabbi Warren Goldstein has been the chief rabbi of South Africa since January 2005. As a national leader, he drives Torah, humanitarian, and educational initiatives across South Africa. He's a qualified Dayan and has a PhD in human rights and constitutional law. And he's also a columnist in the Jerusalem Post. So Stephen, you've got a lot of plugging tonight, so don't worry. Both of these honored and esteemed gentlemen have been given this gift of the Horot to be able to transmit, which is why I'm very excited to hear the interview that's following, which will be conducted by Gila Fine, who is the editor-in-chief of the Magid Books, that's current publishers. I'm not allowed to uh, acknowledge the presence of my dear friend Matthew Miller, who's the head of Koran Publishers. Gila is a teacher of Talmudic narrative and has previously taught at the Hebrew University and Tel Aviv University and the Shalom Hartman Institute. It gives me great pleasure to introduce them and I want to just tell you briefly that The Legacy is a book about what should and can be, now and always. It talks about Derech Eretz, about Midot, and being a mensch. I wish all of you a pleasant evening, and ask you again, if I didn't mention it, to please turn off your phones and enjoy. Thank you. Can you hear me? No. No. I cannot be heard. Rabbis. There is a wonderful anecdote in the book. There's several very wonderful anecdotes in the book, but there's one that I particularly like uh, about the founding father of the Musa movement, Rabbi Israel of Salant, who was invited by one of his disciples for a Friday night meal. Before accepting the author, Rabbi Israel asks his disciple, what, what does your Shabbat table look like? And the disciple, eager to impress his master, says, oh, Rabbi, According, everything is done according to the highest of halachic standards. Our meat is all black and under the strictest supervision. Our cook is a widow of a Talmud Chacham and she follows the laws of Kashrut to the letter. My own wife oversees the preparation of food and makes sure everything is okay. And the meal, Rabbi, the meal, it goes on for hours. We sing, we talk Torah, we discuss the Pasha. It's a true celebration of Kedushat Shabbat. And so Rabbi Sa'ad agrees on one condition. The meal must not exceed two hours. And that Friday night they sit down, it's like a race. First course goes directly into the soup, which is immediately changed by the main course and goes strictly, quickly into dessert. Hardly a word of Torah is spoken, no songs are sung. And by the time they get to the Katamazon, the disciple, crestfallen, turns to Rabbi Sa'ad and says, Rabbi, what was wrong? What, what fault have you found with my Shabbat table? Another side, rather than answering, asks that the cook, the widow, be called up from the kitchen. And as she enters the dining room, he says, we must apologize to you. I believe you were in an awful rush this evening. And she says, God bless you, Rabbi, and may you always be our Friday night guest. <laughs> our meals are usually so long and I'm so terribly tired by the time they end, I can barely make it home. But tonight, tonight I can go home and have a proper Shabbat rest. 
Abisai turns to his disciple and says, Celebration of Gushat Shabbat is wonderful, but not at the expense of another person. The reason I find the story remarkable is that it's, it beautifully represents the world of Lithuanian Jewry as it is captured in the book. It's a world of deep religious devotion and profound ethical passion. A world of strict halachic observance and even stricter moral conduct. A world where the commitment to Torah is rivaled only by the commitment to Derech Eretz. Rabbi Wein, Rabbi Goldstein, welcome. Thank you. Before diving into the book, as we shall, I'd like to ask you, what makes a community rabbi and a historian and a chief rabbi come together to write a book? And why specifically a book about Lithuanian Jewry? Well, it's not the money that I'll tell you. You must all buy the book. Uh, if I may... Uh, the Midrash, uh, Rashi quotes a Midrash uh, that when Moses sent the spies to look at the land of Israel, he said, we read them at the Aretz Mahi, that we see what the land is. So uh, the Midrash says, well, you know, I mean, what does he mean by that? The Rashi there quotes, Yesh Eretz Megadelet Giborim, Yesh Eretz Megadelet Chaloshim. There is a land that grows heroes, and that produces strong and vital people. And there are countries and lands that don't do that. Uh, Lithuania, for uh, hundreds of years, produced uh, giants in the Jewish world. And even though the Lithuanian Jewish community was small in numbers compared to uh, Poland and Central Europe and later Russia, but it was of enormous influence because it produced giants. And uh, Rabbi Goldstein and I uh, benefited from the fact, I benefited directly. The Talmud says that uh, when he once asked Rabbi Yudha Anossi, uh, how come you're so great? Rabbi Yudha, the prince, he was the editor of the Mishnah, uh, the friend of the Roman Emperor, and he said, Pamachas uh, Roisi Rabbi Meir Meachorov. Once I saw the back of Rabbi Meir. If I would have seen him head on, I would have been greater. But at least I saw him from the back. So I personally still saw Lithuanian Jewry from the back. My grandfather, my father, my teachers in the yeshiva, they were all lit. And that made an enormous impression upon me. Rabbi Goldstein, who uh, is, uh, believe it or not, younger than I am, <laughs> and will remain so, uh, he uh, studied from the next generation, the disciples of Rabbi Meir, so to speak. And we had a conversation a number of years ago about how important it would be to somehow record the tradition that we received from those great people. And uh, unfortunately, Lithuanian Jewry was almost completely destroyed in the Holocaust. 98, 99% of Lithuanian Jewry was destroyed. And uh, so to speak, it's a, uh, a task that we felt that we should try and show the value system uh, that drove Lithuanian Jewry, uh, the legacy that we had from its great teachers, and uh, <coughs> the fact that somehow that legacy should be known uh, in a world where Lithuanian Jewry almost is non-existent. I'd, I'd like to um, pick up on what Rabbi Wan has said. Can I just add one thing? She, <laughs> she did not Google Lithuanian humor in Hebrew. <laughs> uh, I'll attest to that because I did, and the results are numerous. Um, 
I just wanted to pick up on the point that, that you mentioned, Rabbi Wine, and that is about the value system, because that's actually what this book is, is about. Uh, before getting there, uh, which I'm going to come back to in one moment, I just want to um, uh, correct uh, something that you said, Gila. I think it's an important clarification, um, because, and, and it goes to the heart of this book, which is about values. It's, it's not just about the um, geography of a particular place or even the history of a particular group of people. It's about the values, and, and, and that's what, what makes this book interesting because it's, it's talking about values that are incredibly relevant today and tomorrow for how we live as the Jewish people, and, and we certainly believe that these values have a very important role to play in modern Jewish society. Uh, but it's in the context of those values that you, be, you began the story, Gila, which I, I think it's an important story because it, it, it's uh, an emblem of, of the importance of Derek Eretz, of the importance of midot tavot, of good character, of decency, of integrity. But, but the key teaching of, of, of these great rabbis was it's not, you need to have Torah, but it also must be ethical and decent in Derek Eretz. But that the very foundations of Torah are, 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 are intertwined with the Derek Eretz. The Derek Eretz is part of the Torah, and if you try and take it out, there isn't Torah. You, you, if you take Derek Eretz out of Torah, you don't have Torah that's left. Um, but it just doesn't happen to have Derek Eretz. It actually, the, the Torah itself disintegrates. There's, there's a passage there quoting from Rav Aaron Kotler, who says that if, if you take the, the decency and, and the kindliness and the sensitivity out of, of Torah, well, you, what's left is not is something that may carry the name of Torah, but it's, it's, it's really just in form. And, and, and that's, that's part of, of, of one of the, the, the very important dimensions of this legacy. It was saying that these things shouldn't be separated. It's not I'm Torah and I'm ethical at the same time. They actually are two sides of the same coin and cannot be separated. And by the way, the relationship works the other way as well. That in the same way, without Derek Eretz, there's no Torah. It's at the Mishnah Pirke Avot. Without Torah, there's also no Derek Eretz. Because the Torah itself teaches us what it means to be a mensch. And um, th that, I think, for, for both of us, for Rabbi Wan and for me, was an important part of writing this book to say, here are values that although were taught by people who, who, who lived in a very different set of physical circumstances, these are eternal values. And that's why the word legacy, it's not just about the past, it's about the future. Actually, I think the word legacy has a double connotation, the past and the future. And that's why the subtitle is teachings for life from the great Lithuanian rabbis. It's not the history of the great Lithuanian rabbis, it's what they would say to us today if, uh, if, if these great Rosh Yeshiva were to walk into to this hall today and be amazed at the incredible miracles of the rebuilding of the city of Yerushalayim. They, what would they say to us today in modern Jewish society, modern Israeli society, Jewish society all around the world, and that's what we've tried to capture. I'd like to continue where you just left off because I think it's very important to make the clarification this is not a work of history, although it contains very many historical facts and figures. It's also not a work of religious philosophy, although it contains quite a bit of that too. Essentially, the legacy is a work of morality. We have a tradition of ethical wills uh, where great rabbis leave a document behind to their descendants and they instruct them in the fundamentals of Jewish life. The legacy is such a work. It outlines the core values and principles by which a Jew must live. Pleasantness and derch eretz, integrity and vikut, limut Torah and unity. If you will, it is an ethical will for the 21st century. And so what I'd like to do in the little time that we have is to try and, 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 and pick at a few of these values, a few of these principles, and discuss them one by one, because the book is divided into nine chapters, and each one of them highlights another value. And I'd like to start with you, Rabbi Wein. Um, your first choice, your opening for this book, is the value of pleasantness, which is a very unusual choice, I think. Um, when you think about the... Uh, the cardinal values of Torah, pleasantness is the first thing that comes to mind. And so I'd like to ask, why, why was that the first choice? What's so significant about pleasantness? <coughs> to put it uh, bluntly, in an unpleasant manner, <laughs> uh, if you're not pleasant, 
or if the actions are not pleasant, it's not part of Torah. We uh, recite the famous verse from uh, Proverbs, uh, the ways of the Torah are pleasantness. So we see that the Talmud, for instance, says that on Sukkot, uh, there is a great uh, palm branch, a great lulav that's kosher in every way, and it's beautiful, and it's big, and it's plentiful, but we're not allowed to use it because of the fact that it has thorns at the bottom. And a person that comes to cut it will prick his hand. So that's not Yocher Dachi Noam. The Torah would not tell us to do such a thing that does not reflect pleasantness. When we find great halachic opinions by many of the great Lithuanian rabbis on very complicated and uh, really delicate subjects, such as freeing a woman whose husband has disappeared and other matters such as that, or helping a woman who can't have children and how to work that out. And they say, well, the ways of the Torah are pleasantness, and therefore I have an obligation somehow to find a pleasant way out of this situation. And uh, I think that that's a bedrock value in Judaism. If it's not pleasant, you know, the, the Rebbe of Kotsk used to say that there are no fast days in the Jewish world. He said there's only Tisha B'Av and Yom Kippur. He said Yom Kippur, who needs to eat? And Tisha B'Av, who can eat? So there are no fast days. Uh, we are not a religion of asceticism. We're not a religion of deprivation. We're not a religion that advocates poverty, that we advocate balance in how a person treats money. Uh, we're, uh, we're supposed to be pleasant people. And uh, unfortunately, we're always, uh, over our thousands of years, we've been painted into uh, all sorts of situations which make it difficult to be pleasant. But the value system, the goal, is Jocher Darchino. You have a lovely phrase in the context of this chapter. You say it's a, a common Lithuanian phrase, from is a galach. Yeah, well, see, uh, when, when, we were a, uh, when we were in the yeshiva, so we would ask the Rebbe, he would talk about somebody. So we would say, Rebbe, is he from? Meaning, is he observant? Is he a Sabbath observer? And he would say, you know, that's not us. You know, from is a, is a word that's used in different faiths. It has nothing to do with us. But the question is, is he Ehrlich? Is he a good person? Is he honest? Does he have integrity? That's the question to ask. And uh, that was drummed into us. That was really drummed into us. And just one more thing on pleasantness. Uh, Lithuanian Jewry saw itself as a family. And therefore, even if you had uh, cousins that were communists, he was still part of the family somehow. We were stuck with him, but he was part of the family. And we reacted, therefore, as a family. I remember my father-in-law was the quintessential Lithuanian rabbi. Well, so the first time we came to Israel, it was in 1968, and uh, we, uh, he got up one morning and he said, uh, Beryl, he said, today we got to go. I have to see my, my cousins, my cousins' children. I said, fine, where are they? Mayor Shore and Mingula? He said, no, they're in Kibbutz Daphne. Uh, Kibbutz Daphne is a Shomer Atzair, left of left, up on the Lebanese border. They don't have any of it. I said, Pop, we are going to He said, what are you talking about? He said, they're my cousin's children. When we went to Kibbutz Daphne. And he embraced them and they embraced him. Today, uh, I don't want to say, you know, it's more difficult today to, to embrace. But the Lithuanian Jewry felt itself to be a family. And in family, everybody's got a nutty uncle. That's the way it goes. Uh, I think just to, to come in on there, um, right, those who have uh, visited in, in South Africa know, know South African Jewry. Um, one, one of the, 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 the strong points of the community is this ability across the divide between um, 
uh, religiously observant and, and non-religiously observant. Uh, they're, they're, they're good relationships and there's communication and there's an openness and there's warmth. And also within the Torah communities as well, that uh, they, 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 there's a respect that it doesn't matter if people are coming from different tashkafas, different philosophies. Uh, by and large, you know, there's, there's a tremendous amount of respect. I'm not saying that there, there are no faribles in the community. I've seen my fair share of those over the last number of years. And, you know, people are people. But, but there's an ethos that says, as Rabbi Wan was saying, this concept of, of being part of, of one family. And, and, and it doesn't matter about these things which, which divide us, but we, we try and reach across those divides. I just wanted to clarify on, on this statement that was mentioned before about um, it said a Jew is not from a Jew is Ehrlich. It, it needs a bit of clarity because um, it, it, could, it could be misunderstood. Meaning the observance of halakha is, is, is the basics. I mean, that's, that's you know, starting at, at uh, foundation level. Um, and and that's, you know, it's, that, that statement shouldn't be interpreted to say, well, it doesn't matter if one keeps the halakha or not, just got to be a decent person. It, it's not saying that. Halakha is the foundation upon which Judaism is built. But what, what it's saying is, what's, what's the driving ethos? And, and part of what, what is mentioned in the book is an idea from Rav Shlomo Walby, which is, uh, you know, obviously the famous uh, Talmud of Rabbi Rucham and, you know, part of this line of, of, of great Rabonim. And, and he, he talks about a very interesting concept. What is Frumkite? What is it? And, and he says something which is very radical. And if he hadn't said it, I certainly would would not have even dared to think it, let alone say it in public, but I'm, I'm riding on, on, on his shoulders. And that's the beauty of the book, is we, you know, the, we, what we're really putting across is not our philosophy of, of life, it's what we've received from our teachers and handing it on. And what Ravalvi says there, he says that a human being has a number of natural instincts and drives. Uh, so, that, you know, there's the, the, there's the drive to, to eat, uh, reproduction, accumulation of material goods. These are all physical drives within a person and he says there is another natural drive within a person and that is the desire to uh, to be close to God and, and he links it with all of these because he says you know what they share in common and it's, it's, it's radical it sounds radical but Rabbi Shlomo Walby says it comes from Rabbi Rucham this is this is part of, of our tradition he says because they share in common that they all are self-centered drives they, they're about self-gratification and, and the Torah comes along, Judaism comes along, the Torah, the halacha, our whole ethos, comes to take all of these physical drives and channel them to make them positive in the world. So the desire to eat, to accumulate, to reproduce, all of these physical desires, are take, Judaism takes them and channels them to make them positive, and so too, the desire to be religious. That, when they were talking about frum, what they mean is the desire to be religious. And it says, just because someone wants to be religious doesn't mean that the outcome is going to be positive. That, that, that even with the best intentions in the world, that the outcome can be enormously destructive if it's not guided by an overall ethic, which is what, what Judaism does. God gave us the Torah to guide us in all these things. So that, that desire to be from, to be close to God, you can almost feel, well, that justifies anything. And he quotes from Rabbi Sal Salam who talks about from and Nagia, which means a person is partial because of, of their feelings of self-righteousness. And that all of a sudden can allow a person to justify speaking Lashon Hara about other Jews, dividing themselves from other Jews, attacking other people, behaving in a manner which is not in accordance with their appearance. Because you say, well, I'm, I'm doing this because this is the self-righteous indignation. And if it's, if it's self-righteous, if, if it comes from righteousness, it must be holy. But what they taught was you, the, sometimes the Yetzir Tov, the Yetzir Hara, the evil inclination, dresses up like the Yetzir Tov. He looks very from, and, and, try, and, and, and is justifying the actions in the name of religion, and that can be such a destructive force in the world if it's not contained within a broader value system. And what the Torah tries to do is channel that, make it positive, do something good with it. And that's why from by itself can't be, because that's just an instinct. It's just the driving force within a person, and it needs to be contained within a broader value system of Torah values, not an external value system. That is what the Torah was given for. Yeah. Rabbi Goldstein, you mentioned Derech Eretz, and I'd like to pick up on that, because the first value you choose to highlight is Derech Eretz, which you describe, and I quote, as basic, decent human behavior. That's a quote. However, when you read into the chapter, you find that the bar for this basic, decent human behavior is set very, very high. According to some of the halachic examples you quote, 
Anybody who throws a piece of paper on the floor, who takes a book out of the library shelf and puts it back in the wrong spot, anyone who eats in the marketplace, anyone who gulps down a whole glass of drink in one go, and I see some of your faces, these people are devoid of their hurts. And according to the Shulchan Aruch, some of them are even, and this is extreme, are considered Rashaim who are not allowed to give testimony in a court of law. This is a very high standard for basic decency. The, the term mensch, which is used, you know, we always say, you know, to be a mensch, and it's uh, mentioned as the, as, as, as the as chapter, um, it means to be a person, which means this, the Torah was given to a human being. So, so God expects at the starting, at the entrance level, we must be good people. And then on top of that, the Torah builds incredible excellence um, in, in all spheres. But the, the, the minimum bar of being a human being is to act with decency, with dignity. And, and it's true that it, it takes... A, the reason why there are many of these statements in the Talmud which are so critical of a person who's acting with the lack of their it's because the, the Talmud is saying such a person almost loses the status of being a human being because the difference between a human being and an animal one dimension is, is that culturedness, that sense of refinement. And then that has to be the foundation upon which uh, a whole lot of the other values are added. But what I point out in that chapter is that the value of Derech Eretz, of the decency and the civility, is intertwined with the other Torah values of Midot Tovot, which is good character, that's part of humility, not being jealous, slow to anger, that's uh, the, the, the good character, and then, um, and then also the mitzvot bein Adam lechaveiro, the, the mitzvahs between um, interpersonal mitzvot, and, it's, and, and, and th there's a lot of interplay between all of these values. You take, for example, a commandment like honoring parents, that is a mitzvah, it's also derech eretz, it's also midot tavod, it's also good character, so these values are intertwined, but the derech eretz that you're referring to in your question is about the refinement of a person, and, and this is something, I'm sure Rabbi Wein has, has many examples, but uh, I remember uh, my Rosh Hashiva, blessed memory, uh, talking about this often. He used to say, for example, um, tzitzit, wearing tzitzit. He said, look, you want to wear your tzitzit in or out, you know, that's your, that's, you can make that decision, but they must be neat. Or, you know, and, and he was always bothered by how someone could take a box of tissues and put it on a bimah. He said, the bimah was there for the, the Sefer Torah, and, you know, and, and how does a... Uh, um, and, and then I, I remember one time that um, it was just after uh, Shabbos and he called the whole yeshiva together because he said he saw a guest walking into shul and everyone was in the middle of their davening and, 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 they didn't, and the person did not have a chair, didn't have a sitter and everyone continued davening and ignored him. So he called all of the students in immediately that Sunday morning and he said, look, he saw the person come in, they were looking around, he said, you know how awkward it is, someone walks into a new shul, they walk into a new place, they don't have a chair, they don't know where they are. Uh, you know, the, the, the all halakhot, laws of, of how one can interrupt one. He says, you, you stop. He said, we learned from Abraham. When, when, when the angels came, he thought they were just um, Arab wayfarers and idolaters. And, and yet he was talking to God. He interrupts the conversation with God to go and help them to do Hachnas Rochim. He said, can't, he said to us at the time, I remember it, it seared into my memory. He said, you can't tell, said, you can't tell me that your davening is any closer than Abraham's communication directly with Hashem. So he said, why don't you, you, you stop? You should have got up, given the person a place. And, and it was those kind of examples all the time where it became really practical. It took it just from the words into being something real that trained us the whole time is that we have to look at our mitzvahs and our service of God in terms of the people around and the sensitivity and kindness to those around us. The, the rabbi stretched it even more uh, that there's a respect for inanimate objects, not only for human beings. Uh, we, we just finished the book of Shemot, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, God, the Moshe, is not allowed to smite the, the water, and he's not allowed to smite the earth, because the water saved him, the earth saved him, he owes them, so to speak, consideration. But now the earth is in, the, the ground is inanimate, and the Nile River is inanimate. What does the Nile River know whether he hits it or he doesn't hit it? But Moshe knows, right? Moshe knows. And so there's that lesson. So all of their inheritance is a lesson to the person as to his relationship with the world, with nature, with God, and with other human beings. That's why it's called their inheritance. It's the way of the world. 
And so therefore, it gives us a different perspective. I remember when I was in the yeshiva, that if you, well, if you took a uh, candy wrapping or something and left it on the floor, they, uh, he would not start the class. He wouldn't, he wouldn't he'd say, well, we can't open the Gemara's because, uh, you know, uh, look at that. And we would say, well, you know, like Amer American cute to throw something on the floor. I mean, that's as natural as, uh, <laughs> as baseball. I mean, what, how can... But uh, eventually we got the message that, you know, somebody's got to clean it up, right? You throw it on the floor, somebody's going to have to clean it up. And therefore you owe that somebody the Derek Harris is not doing it. So, the book begins with... Um... And I just want to make one more point. We're talking here about perfect people. There are no perfect people. There weren't perfect people in Lithuania either. What you said is set the bar high. Certainly it set the bar high. Because if you don't aspire for great things, then you can't accomplish even the small things. The Torah sets the bar very high, and the Torah itself says, There are no perfect human beings, but that's the bar. That's what it's supposed to be. And the people say, well, you know, it's good enough, you know. You know. And that's why I think, following on what Rabbi Wine is saying, that uh, in the book there was even a part where we had a discussion, I remember our, our telephone call, uh, because in Rabbi Wine's chapter he mentions the very tragic story of Rabbi Salsalanta's son and, and the difficulties and the, of, of, of what took place. And, you know, I said it's, it's quite, you know, that incident is, is quite jarring, and, but he said it's true. Would, would you tell us a bit about the incident? Well, the, the, the incident was that uh, we saw Salante had a son mm -hmm. that was a, uh, uh, a great mathematician, and he was offered a professorship in the University of St. Petersburg, and the University of St. Petersburg was so anxious to have him that he, they said, you don't have to convert, because otherwise every Jew that wanted a professorship had to convert to the Russian Orthodox religion. You don't even have to convert. But he, uh, he no longer was an observant Jew, and uh, he invented, he created a, uh, something in mathematics called the Lipkin parallelogram, which until today in geometry, I, you know, I never got that fourth grade, but in geometry <laughs> somehow, Somehow it done something. <laughs> and it's named after him, the Lipkin. Maybe saw Salanter's name was Lipkin. So the, uh, uh, the uh, enlightened ones of his age who wanted to push uh, uh, the idea of professorships and secular studies over Torah took an ad in the newspaper and they said, we want to congratulate the great Rabbi Yisrael Salanter on the honor that he has that his son was appointed professor at the University of St. Petersburg, etc., etc. In the next issue of the newspaper, Rabbi Yisrael Salanter took an ad and he said, since all my life I have tried to tell the truth, I want you to know that I have no nachas from my son and that I do not approve of his ways, and that anyone that can help return him to Jewish observance, I will be grateful to him in this world and in the next. Signed, Yisrael Lipkin of Salant. So that, so it's not perfect, right? So now you but, see why I didn't want that in, <laughs> and which I then brought it to your attention now, but, uh, but Rabbi Wine's point was... But the point is, you see the greatness of the Rebbe Yisrael, and you see that there are, no matter how great you are, uh, the perfection escapes us. And, and I think that's the point, is that we, we, we live in a world where, where, um, which is filled with imperfections because as human beings God gave us free choice. And, and I think that's why also it's important to have that story in the book because the, this book is not an attempt to to you know, um, idealize a, a particular society and say that it was perfect, and you know, to look at everything with, with rose-colored glasses. You know, it, it, it was a society of human beings. There was greatness. There were failings. Um, but but we have to keep on setting the bar as high as possible to come back to this point. And 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 
and, and the great Musa teachers uh, set that bar so high. E even this thing we're talking about, Frumka, you, you see what, what the, the Musa movement did was said, look at everything we do and introspect and think all the time. You know, even if it seems to be motivated positively, what's, what's beneath that, that positive motivation? Maybe there's something underlying it which is self-centered. Maybe there's something that I'm doing. What about the consequences? The Muslim movement kept on teaching. What about the consequences of what I'm doing? It may seem positive and wonderful today, but what impact will it have? Even the story that you began with, Gilad, saying, on the one hand, you, you've got a wonderful Shabbos experience. On the other hand, what's the consequence for the woman who's, who's in the kitchen? And how, how will that uh, affect her life? And, and so much of what we have to do is, is, is filtering all the time. And it is a very high standard. And it's one which we all, it's, it's, it's a lifetime's work. I mean, even, I mean, maybe I must only speak on behalf of myself, but I'm sure that Rabbi Wine will agree. As authors, we're writing down the teachings we receive. We're not claiming to be uh, the bearers of this in our lives. It's, it's, it's a constant, Rabbi Wine, yes, but me not. It's a constant. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi, we, we didn't put rabbi in the book. It doesn't say Rabbi Vera Wine. It doesn't say Rabbi Warren Goldstein. It does in some places. It doesn't well, say the covers. And the covers. <laughs> the covers One of the values is the, humility. The, yeah. No, because, because we're not preaching here. That's not our task. It's not our, this is not a sermon from the uh, pulpit. This is, a, this is a conduit of teachings that we receive that, uh, as you put, put the bar very high, but our, that's, what Ju that's what Judaism is. I always say you shouldn't confuse Jews with Judaism. Yeah, and sometimes they have two different things. Can I just... And you shouldn't confuse rabbis with religion. Sometimes it's also <laughs> two different things. Um, rabbi Goldstein, you mentioned the great teachers of Musa, and Rabbi Wine, you devoted a chapter to the Musa movement, and to its core value of dveikut, of cleaving to God. Uh, and you speak about this very unique literature brand of dveikut, which is a, a very quiet, very private, very restrained kind of religious fervor, as opposed to the louder, more boisterous, more highly emotional religious fervor that we're used to seeing today. Um, is it possible, is it really possible to achieve dveikut in this restrained, disciplined kind of literature way? Well, they seem to have been able to do it. Uh, you know, the, the world says a culto litvak, you know, a cold Lithuanian, because he's cold, you know, he's, he's not overly emotional, he's not overly ecstatic. Uh, if you went to, to you know, even today, for instance, if you go to certain yeshiva, the davni is very intense, but it's not necessarily with, with melody, with music, with ecstasy, etc. Uh, so, uh, but what that, what that does is it forces it inside instead of outside. Inside, you have to reach within yourself, within the great depths within yourself, to say, you know, I'm talking to God and I want him to hear me and, I'm, and I really mean what I say. And uh, that's not easy, but that, uh, again, uh, that, that was the, uh, the status. And it has to do a lot with the... Uh, Society also, I mean, Lithuania was not a very uh, wealthy country, and nobody ever moved to Lithuania for the weather, and, uh, <laughs> you know, and it was small, and it was, you know, and you got gigantic countries, it was uh, Prussia on one side, and Russia on the other side, and it always had these things, right, and the, uh, so that influenced the Jews as well, you know, there was very little to be boisterous about. And therefore, you have to work on yourself. But I think having said that, it's probably also very personal. I mean, there, there, there are certain uh, doubling styles, for example, uh, is, is a personal thing. You'll find some people who are very exuberant, others more restrained, even with, 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 within. But I think the point that, that Rabbi Wein, that this last point here, is a very important one about external <coughs> versus internal. So I, I'm going to stop you right there, because that's my next question for you. Yeah. Your next chapter is about Ehrlichkeit, this Yiddish concept of, of truth, of sincerity. Mm -hmm. And you speak about the importance of truthfulness, of keeping one, one's word. Uh, what I found most remarkable in this chapter is the importance of keeping, of, of, of being true not to others, but actually to oneself. You speak about the importance of preserving personal integrity. And you very strongly criticize people who adopt um, 
these outward shows, these outward signs of piety, these external stringen stringencies, which don't always correspond to their internal spiritual state. Um, and so carrying on, as you started saying, it's, we seem to see a lot of that today. You know, I spoke uh, on Sunday yeah, night. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I spoke on, on Sunday night in a Monday Um and I spoke a bit about some of these issues. And then someone in the audience uh, stood up and, and used the ammunition and the commas that I've been speaking about against another group of Jews in Israel. And I said, you know, the the, the great teachings of the Musa movement was that. If you hear something really interesting about human nature and about the need to, to introspect, that introspection is self-introspection. Because you know, some people think, okay, that's, that's, that's a wonderful sermon. He's talking about the guy next to me. And, and, and I think that that's, our reaction always has to be internal, which it was. And, but I wanted just to pick up on, on this point that you mentioned about external versus internal. Because this was a very important value. Of, of integrity, of, of outside piety reflecting who we are inside. And one of the most remarkable halakhic rulings, I mean, you hear this and, it, and it's almost, uh, it's, it's difficult to believe, but it's written there in, in the chuvas of Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, where he was asked about the shaila of blended whiskey. And I'm not going to get into the halakhic technicalities of, of what that is, but Rabbi Moshe Feinstein looks at the different opinions, and um, he says that in his view there are lenient opinions with it, because of the grapes and the, and the Yain Nessa, and there are stringent opinions. And he said he personally, in his personal life, he follows the stringent opinion. Um, but he says those who follow the lenient opinion, they've got uh, good halakhic grounds to rely. But then he adds this uh, amazing thing right at the end of the tube, uh, just almost um, throwaway. throwaway, almost uh, unaware of him, what, what he's writing. He says but when he's in public, he will have the, the blended whiskey in accordance with the lenient opinions so that it shouldn't look like yuhara, which is a halachic concept in the Gomorrah, which is arrogant. So here you have Rav Moshe Feinstein, the greatest gadol hador, the great, you know, uh, I remember when our Rosh Hashiva used to speak about Rav Moshe and saying the greatest post uh, you know, post the war, full stop. And, and, and he feels, personally he feels he needs to follow the stringent opinion, but when he went in public, he went with the leading one because he didn't want people to think that he's carrying himself in an arrogant fashion. And, and, and that's just a reflection of, of the kinds of, of values that, that, that we're talking about here that says, what are the consequences, you know, and, and how, and, um, and the one has to be constantly aware of what it looks like to other people. And this is what one's doing, is it, is it creating barriers, is it creating an impression of superiority. Because what Walby talks about in Frumkind is that some, it's so often driven by a desire to show superiority over another person. It becomes climbing the corporate ladder, but from a religious point of view, because look how from I am versus you. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's why there was this big emphasis on, fine, you know, if, if you want to take on something mm -hmm. which is of greater stringency, do it privately. Even privately. Make sure that it's in accordance with who you are as a person. One of the, the tells the Rosh Hashivas used to always tell over this, uh, this thing. I heard it from, from, my, from my Rebbe. Um, and that is, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a discussion in the Gomorrah about how long you have to wait after meat uh, to, to eating milk. And so one opinion, so he, um, I, I think it was Marukva, he says, uh, he says, you know, my father used to keep, um, he said, I'm vinegar the son of wine. Because my father kept 24 hours and I only wait from one meal to the next. So, so Avram Yitzchak Bloch, the Tells of Rosh Hashiva, blessed memory, said, well, why did he, if he felt it was such a great thing to keep the 24 hours, then why didn't he do that? So he says because he felt he wasn't on the right level. And, and, and that when that stringency, when he takes on that stringency... Well, it wasn't him. It wasn't him. He, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't a true reflection of... He, he felt his father was greater than him, and his father could take on such a thing, but not him. And, 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 and often people fall into wanting to get the latest stringency because it, become, it can become a status symbol of, 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 of who they are. I'd like to ask you both. Um, each of you, in your own way, touch upon um, the centrality of Torah study. And so I'd like to ask you, the, the yeshivot of, the great yeshivot of Lithuania, Volozhin, Mir, Slobodka, Tells, to name a few, they've become the prototypes for all modern yeshivot today. Uh, so much so that the term mitbak is almost synonymous today with this intense, rigorous study of Torah. I'd like to know why, out of all of the Batemidash of Europe, what, what is it that made the 
Lithuanian yeshivot, the golden standard for Torah learning? Because uh, <coughs> Chaim Valozhin, Chaim Rabinowitz, who was the uh, founder of the great yeshiva Valozhin, uh, he, he uh, emphasized over and over again that it's Torah Lishma. It's the sake of the study of Torah for the sake of the study of Torah, period. It's not for honor, it's not for a position. In fact, in the Lithuanian yeshiva, uh, it, uh, it was not, so to speak, acceptable even that you should get rabbinic ordination. If you wanted to get rabbinic ordination, you went to private rabbis and they ordained you. But the yeshiva didn't because that was not its purpose. Its purpose was the study of Torah. And Reb Chaim uh, pointed out that the study of Torah is essential for the preservation of the Jewish people. The Jewish people cannot survive without Torah. If we have Torah, we can have everything else. You can have the Hebrew University. But if we only have the Hebrew University, then you're going to make it. And, that, and so he said that centrality of the study of Torah, Torah Lishma, and then on a Kabbalistic level, he said, the study of Torah, Torah Lishma, really is what preserves the entire universe. It preserves everything that exists in the world. And therefore, in Valozhin, for instance, they had shifts of people studying Torah, so that Torah was studied 24, days a, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. It never stopped. I remember my grandfather, of blessed memory, told me that when he was 14 years old and he came into the yeshiva, so the young guys that came into the yeshiva, they gave him the three in the morning shift. <laughs> he had to study from three to, to eight thirty in the morning when they would die. Well, so, but that was the so uh, that didn't exist anywhere else in an organized form. It exists amongst individuals, great individuals but in an organized form, that's a Lithuanian creation. And if I may add, it's also a, a question of strategic vision. Because if you think about it, looking at the Jewish world, that we are facing so many different challenges um, of assimilation, of different threats, and, and, and really what, what they taught was, was, was a phrase that we heard so often from a particular Midrash which says, Hashem said, Alavai, if only the people would leave me but still learn my Torah, Hashem says in the Midrash, because Hama'or Sheba Hayamasirim Labuta. The light within it will bring them back to the good. And, and, and that's, that's a belief in a strategic vision for the future of the Jewish people, that the root of all ills is when we are detached from, from Torah learning, and the source of all blessing is when we are connected to it. Um, and, and, and so there's, there's that sense of we as a, as a people have to be connected. It's contained in one, in one story where the Gomorrah relates the great Rabbi Yochanan ben Zaka was given a chance to, to save the city of Yerushalayim and the Beis Amikdash when, when he was talking to the Roman general outside the city who had just become the season and was given that opportunity to save it all and he said in place of Yerushalayim he said Tenli Yavne v'chachameha Give me Yavne and her sages because he knew that as long as there was Torah learning going on within the Jewish people, that would be the energy and the light that would ensure that we would have the strategic vision, whether as individuals or as a people. If we're not learning, we don't understand what Hashem wants from us. We don't understand the light of, of His wisdom and to be able to give us the full context for our lives. So, I'd like to bring this discussion to a close because it's getting a bit late and like obviously I want to make sure you all have a good night's rest. But I would like to just ask. I uh, think they begin their rest already. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, one final question, and we'll see if we have maybe a few minutes for one or two questions from the audience. Um, the book is extremely rich in its discussion of values, of principles, of ethics. If I had to push you and say, choose one value. One teaching that is most pertinent, most necessary for our generation today, which would it be? <laughs> well, I, I think that we just discussed that. The value would be the study of Torah. 
if we have Torah, then we're going to have Derech Eretz, we have everything, right? Because everything is in the Torah. But if there is, God forbid, no Torah, uh, there's no loyalty to Torah, so then, uh, so, as you know, Derek Harris becomes uh, the platform of the Democratic Party in the United States. <laughs> well, and which, which can change every four years, right? <laughs> so uh, the centrality to me is uh, that, that, uh, that idea of Torah. And I, I'm going to say uh, something else, and that is, in, in a certain sense, what, what, what we're trying to do here was we... we um, painted ourselves into a corner, because um, you see it in the introduction um, to the book, which, which is very important. Don't skip over the introduction. It gives the, the full context for understanding what the book is about, because what, what it raises is this. At the heart and soul of Judaism is that everything is important. The Mishnah Pirka Avot says, Be careful with what you perceive to be a light mitzvah, like you would with something which is serious, because we, we, we take it all, all of Shulchan Aruch, all of the Torah, all, all of Tariyat mitzvot, we embrace it all. But what, what, what the book is arguing for is focus on certain key values. And that sounds that it's in conflict with that basic Torah value that we have to do everything. And of course, we have to strive to do everything. But at the same time, if you look through the ages, you will see, as, as you mentioned, Gila, the, the, um, the Ramban wrote a letter to, to his son, a famous letter that people still study to this day. Now, wh why didn't he just say to his son, it's, a, it's an ethical will, it's an ethical instruction for how to live his life. He, he instructs him about humility and uh, the equality of all people and Yurat Shemaim and, you know, fear of God. Why didn't he just say to him, keep the mitzvahs? One sentence, you know, keep it short. The Vilna Gaon, when he wrote a letter to his family, when he was uh, trying to make Aliyah at that point, he, he wasn't sure when he was going to see them next. It was going to be a long time before they would be reunited. He wrote a letter for how to live in their home. He said, you know, talk to each other kindly. Uh, respect don't your lie. mother. Respect your mother. Respect your grandmother. Yeah. Uh, respect, you know, each other. And, and use words gen gently. And, you know, all of those. Why didn't he just say, keep the Torah? Could have said one sentence to my dear family, keep the whole Torah, full stop. But he didn't do that. Because made for very bad publishing later on. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, so what, 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 what did they do? They said there are certain key values which are the, the, the life force of what the Torah is about. And our whole expression of our Judaism has to conform to those central values in order for it to be called true Torah. And, and, and what we've done in the book is to highlight five or six, just a handful of key values. So, so to take this entire system and turn it into five or six key values. That, that was a big enough step. And then to take all of that and turn it into one, so that can't be done. So I'm, <laughs> that's my answer to your question. Great. That was a true Different. shall I answer, what it is. Not on one leg. Um, all right, so we have very little time. If there are one or two questions from the audience, we're happy to take them. Uh, yes, the lady with the hat, and there is a roving mic on the way to you. Um, could the rabbis please tell us why there is a collective loss of dilachilets around the Kiddush table? <laughs> I, uh... <laughs> I don't agree with your assumption, but uh, but one point I think should be made, and that really is not made enough, and that we are still suffering from the Holocaust, and we will suffer for, in my opinion, many generations to come yet, and its effects are very long-lasting, and that a lot of the things that you see in the Jewish world today are because of what happened to us. And uh, therefore, uh, you cannot judge the Jewish world harshly. Uh, I remember that I came once to Israel after the Yom Kippur War, and uh, the mood here in the country was terrible. Uh, 2,600 uh, soldiers were killed, and the country was almost lost. And I went to see a great rabbi 
I really, uh, you know, to cheer me up. And he said to me, he said, you know, the whole Jewish people, he said, we're in a hospital. He said, some are in intensive care, some are in the psychiatric ward, some are in internal medicine, some are outpatients. But we're all in a hospital, he said. And what's the first rule in a hospital? Quiet. So the doctor doesn't come in in the morning and say, why aren't you better today? Why aren't you out of bed? So then what are we hollering about? Why are we so critical? And I think that that applies to the state of Israel, that the world shouts at us. They don't realize that we are still in the hospital. And it applies to the internal Jewish world as well. We have not, it's only, it's 65, 70 years, you know, it's gone, but it's not gone. And it affects us. So that doesn't mean that we should be discourteous at the table. But it, uh, it does mean that we have to see things in perspective. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, it also means that we need to talk about it. And that's part of what we're hoping to do with this book is sometimes people think that there's, there are certain values which are so basic, you don't, they don't have to be said. But everything has to be articulated and discussed. And the more that we talk about the importance of these values, the more that that, that can lead to, to a general improvement. Yes. One or two more quick questions. And then we really do have to bring you Perfect. to the One. One question. <laughs> Rabbi says, and I defer. Yes. This is an easy one. This is an easy one. What made so many Lithuanian Jews pick South Africa as a country to go to? They knew that Goldstein would be the chief rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think that... Uh, I can tell you the history if you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been in the book, so... Uh, in the 1860s and 1870s, there were terrible pogroms in Russia. The Tsar sponsored, the, uh, the Russian government sponsored the pogroms. Jews started to move. Two and a half million Jews moved out of the Tsarist Empire in about 25 years. Most went to North America, but they went to other places in the world as well. Uh, there were about 150 Jewish families that moved to South Africa, and uh, that which then was under the Boers. And the English had the Cape Colony, and it, uh, South Africa is a beautiful country, it's a wealthy country, it's an enormous country, and they wrote home to their relatives, and they said, you know, why are you putting up with what's going on in the fear of what the Tsar is going to do to you, because this lady was under the Tsar then, from the time of Peter the Great. Come. And so therefore, uh, then there was a gold rush. They discovered gold, and then the Kimberley diamond mines. So then it looked very attractive. And uh, about 20,000 Lithuanian Jews, who all were related to each other in one way or another, came to South Africa. And then their families came, you know, Landsmannschaft, etc., etc. And that's how they ended up in South Africa, uh, especially after the Boer War. And uh, uh, the tragedy is that, uh, you know, that uh, maybe 60, 80,000 more didn't come because that would have made a difference also. And I think what Rabbi Wan is mentioning here, it's, it's maybe a good note to end on because uh, this book, I think for both of us, is very personal in, in, in that sense. I mean, my great-grandfather uh, came from Lithuania to, to South Africa in 1899 and was at the age of 17. And as you say, then he got a, a letter after the war to say that you know, the rest of the family, there was nobody left. Um, and so, so there's that personal connection which, which drove us to write it, but, but also um, the other personal thing, uh, connection, and I think in, in a certain sense um, this, this book is very personal for both of us, 
because it's writing down the teachings of those who taught us. And, and in a sense, it's our responsibility to them as, as disciples and students. You want to write down what your teachers teach you so that that can be shared with other people. So, so that's the legacy. It's a legacy for all of us, but in, 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 in a personal way it is. And in, in the, um, the, the, there's that real sense that we have received a tradition which we're now trying to, to hand on. And, and that's why we felt it was so important to write it down. Uh, Absolutely right. One of the values in the book, which we did not get to discuss tonight, is gratitude, akaratatov. So I'd like to just end by thanking, first of all, the two of you, Rabbi Ryan, Rabbi Godstein. Thank you, and Eva. Rabbi Goldstein and Rabbi will be autographing books after the event for those of you who so wish. I'd like to also thank Judith Singer for putting together the evening. And I'd like to thank our our hosts, both the Beis Synagogue and Chiva, and ask Nina to close the evening for us. And I also just thank uh, Magit Publishers, uh, to Matthew and to Gila and Yudit and, and, and the whole team, um, who were such a, uh, a pleasure to work with. We had a lot of robust discussions, you know, as things got closer and closer to, to, to print deadline, um, but they uh, have uh, done a lot of effort in making the book come out physically beautiful, and, and that's a very important part of it, so I'm grateful to them, and the Rabbi Wan is, and uh, we thank so. them for that. Thank you. I think you'll all agree that it's been a very enlightening evening, and that we'll all go home thinking about our legacy. It was an interesting note that I read that says, since we are feeling very much that we're living in uh, what we call Ikvisa de Mishicha, or Ikvita de Mishicha, time of the Messiah coming. And someone wrote that at that point, or at this point, the Litvaks will recognize that Hasidim also know how to learn, and the Hasidim will realize that Litvaks also are doing Avodat Hashem. <laughs> On that note, before I say Labas Vakaras to all of us, which means good evening, I would like to say, on behalf of Chiba, I hope that in 20, 30 years, when we will meet again for another interesting panel, that there'll be very special stories, not about the women in the kitchen on Shabbat, and not about the women in the back of the bus, but the women who are bringing and inspiring and sharing the legacy. Thank you very much. I want to remind everybody that the rabbis will be available for book signing at the two tables here to the right. Both rabbis will be available for book signing. Books are available for sale outside. And thank you again for coming. As Nina said, remember to turn on your cell phones. And uh, don't forget to go home with an autographed copy. Please remember to look out for things that are happening with FIBA and at the Jerusalem and Great Synagogue. There is Saturday night, March 9th, uh, a very interesting program. Keep uh, your eyes open. Thank you. Saturday night, Gold Lipman.
Nice. Very nice. Her, 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 her grandfather was one of the main rabbis of the Lithuanian Muslim movement, which is Rabbi of your uh, And And uh, as, as an exponent, she, she represents the Musa of her grandfather. I say very good. Very good. I say that exactly. Wow. What do you think the important message of this book, in terms of what it can do today for the Jewish people today, is the message of this book affecting the community, the Jewish community here? What would you hope that, that it might, might be able to do? I think the message of this book and the legacy as, as described by the, by the rabbis is eternal. Uh, and whatever was true of latter day is certainly true for today. And uh, 
do a whole book and uh, stand us instead. With respect for our fellow Jews, which is a very important uh, aspect. And I think that a lot of people have lost that today. I think, uh, I hope you will read the book, we learn more about it, and uh, those will be the role models, the two authors that we'll follow. Okay, very nice. It's clear, come on. We're about to come to the Yeah, yeah. So my name is Loki before I got married, so it's the same name. Loki, Loki. I'm about to miss you, we're about to come to you. Yeah. You know, toys. Then you're talking, you're still recording. David, we need one. When? And you live here in your shrine? I live here in your shrine. Wonderful.